Revelation chapter 4. And um, I'm going to ask you, I'm just going to read it if you'll follow along with me. Uh, the Bible says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf. The third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts, each of them had six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Heavenly Father, thank you for this glimpse of home. Thank you, Lord, for this vision of, 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 of that Beulah land that we just sang about. We want to ask, Lord, for your help tonight to, to imagine and to, uh, uh, Lord, just to consider and, and, and ponder, Lord, the, the words that are before us tonight that we might, uh, Lord, uh, in, in some feeble way, uh, imagine what is before us when we think about our heavenly home. I pray that tonight you would give us an understanding. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you'd be in this room tonight stirring our hearts and, 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 and fueling our imaginations about our heavenly home. And Lord, I pray that, Lord, we would uh, begin even now to learn how to set our affection on things above and not on things of the earth. Lord, to set our affection where things uh, really matter and are eternal in nature rather than giving our thoughts and our energies to, to those things that, 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 that pass away. We love you tonight. Thank you, Lord, for all that are here. And just pray that, Lord, you suit a blessing to each and every need. And as Brother Chris prayed, if there's anybody among us tonight that does not yet know Jesus Christ as Savior, we pray that tonight would be that night when they would see themselves uh, in, in, in need, not of religion, not of good works, not of morality, but of, of a Savior, and see that Jesus Christ is that Savior that their soul longs for and that they must have. And we ask you for these things and ask you to strengthen the saints tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Last Sunday night, as we were taking our uh, the, the beginning of this message uh, uh, and, and getting a glimpse of home, we said that when we uh, began this chapter, we saw the first thing that we saw was that open door, and, and we talked some time about how Jesus Christ compared himself to that door in John chapter 10, and he certainly is that door. That door, uh, we said in John chapter 10, that door to salvation, but also that door to abundant life, and you can go back to John chapter 10 and, and, and re reread that if you'd like to, but uh, that open door is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm so glad it's an open door. I'm so I'm so glad it's not a closed door. Uh, heaven's not closed yet. Heaven's still receiving sinners, amen? Uh, heaven's still receiving those that have come uh, by way of the Lord Jesus Christ. Heaven's invitation is still, is still relevant. It's still real. And God still honors uh, 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 faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as, as, as that entrance there. I'm glad the door in heaven's not closed. I'm glad the old song is true. There's room at the cross uh, 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 for, for one more, amen? There's room at the cross for you. One, room, room for at least one more. And so we have a, uh, an open door and access uh, to heaven uh, because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only did we see that open door in verse number one, we saw in verse number one also these words come up hither. We, we, we see that there's an invitation given, and, and certainly uh, heaven is gained by invitation. The Spirit and the Bride, the last invitation of the Bible in Revelation, say the Spirit and the Bride say come, and whosoever is a thirst come. God's looking uh, uh, to, to, to reclaim and to redeem and uh, rescue lost sinners. That, that invitation stands today, and it ought to be the business of the church to extend that invitation uh, to, to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. There ought to be any... There ought not to be any shame in us uh, inviting sinners to examine uh, the, 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 the claims and the deeds and the, and the works uh, and the validity of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and seeking to win them uh, to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the invitation is also something we see uh, as we get a glimpse of home. Not only the open door and the invitation, but we see in verse number two these words, and immediately I was in the Spirit. Last Sunday night we talked about uh, uh, we see a spirit fullness there, and, and what a dearth of, of Holy Spirit fullness. 
uh, again, we are battling uh, our, our, our own worst enemy, which is our flesh. Uh, Paul said in Romans chapter 7, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And so we've got to contend with this flesh that pulls us away from those heavenly desires, that pulls us away from the Spirit's intent in our heart. And we've got to fight that. And, and certainly we are, we are commanded and invited to, uh, to seek spiritfulness. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And so that spirit fullness is not just for the preacher. It's not just for the missionary. It's not just for the evangelist. It's not just time for the full-time Christian worker. That spirit fullness is for everybody. And let me just say that. Our jobs as parents would be a lot easier if we were spirit-filled. Our job as friends would be a lot easier uh, and, and responsibility as friends would be a lot easier if we were spirit-filled. Uh, young people, uh, obeying mom and dad and honoring your mother and father would be a lot easier if you had the Holy Spirit's help. Amen? It'd be a lot easier if, again, we would invite and, and, and plead with the Holy Spirit uh, to fill us and, uh, and, and to change our desires and to change our appetites and to change our, our direction. That spirit fullness is what we see here in John. And I said last week, it's interesting. When you get full of the Spirit, you begin to see things you never got to see before, and you get to hear things you never heard before. When John was in the Spirit in chapter 1, that's when he first saw the Lord Jesus Christ and got a good view of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he heard the words of the Lord Jesus Christ as Jesus Christ Christ extended this revelation to him. How did it happen? Uh, Jesus Christ found John in, in, in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And we need to be that way as well, Spirit-filled. We also saw uh, last week uh, uh, in, in verse number two, uh, an occupied throne. The throne in heaven was not unoccupied, but it was occupied. And, and the one that sat on that throne uh, that talked with John was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and what a wonderful thing. I don't know about you. Uh, when I look through this chapter and just we just get a brief glimpse of home in this chapter, uh, they're very interesting sights. And we're going to talk about some, of the, some more of those tonight. But I'll tell you what, there's nothing that's going to detract from the beauty and the holiness and the awesomeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm, I'm I'm so glad that we have such a wonderful Savior uh, that sits on that throne, amen, that earned the right to sit on that throne and sits at the right hand of the Father. Why? Because He's already been to earth once. He's already been to Calvary once. He doesn't have to go back, amen. He can sit on that throne until the Father says, go and get your bride, and He will. He'll come back, and we'll hear that, uh, uh, that trumpet blast, and we'll hear that, uh, uh, that call to come up hither, amen, and then uh, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we which are alive in Christ will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and Jesus Christ will fulfill another one one of his promises when he said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. I'm, I'm so glad my Savior makes promises and, and keeps promises. So when we see these strange things and, and wondrous things in heaven, the most beautiful thing we'll see, the most powerful image we'll see is that of the Lord Jesus Christ on his throne. And what a wonderful sight that will be for the child of God. We come to some new ground tonight, though, as we uh, con uh, continue our examination of this chapter. Uh, as we go a little bit further here, we've already talked about that occupied throne and the one that sat on that throne. Uh, and the Bible says uh, uh, he was described in his robes, uh, those robes of uh, uh, jasper and sardine. We said that last week the jasper and sardine had a, uh, a red color uh, that was uh, the, the color of royalty in the Bible. And we saw, uh, said how John was describing the robes that he wore on that. His physical description is not given, but his royal robes are being, descript, uh, being described there. And so that sardine and the, uh, the, the uh, jasper uh, were red stones. It's interesting, I said last week, uh, that the sardine stone uh, had two colors to it. It had a, a blood red color to it and it had a flesh color to it. And as we look at Jesus Christ on the throne, we're reminded of his humanity, how he gave his body to be broken for us. And we see that blood that, that was shed to wash away our sins. And so we're seeing in those colors, we're seeing our, 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 our Savior. And Jesus Christ is even described in Revelation chapter number five as a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And so uh, that's, that's an everlasting testimony to his love and to his grace and to his glory. And, and we see that in his royal robes. The next thing we come to, though, as we see him sitting on his throne or seeing his uh, uh, train fill the temple there, um, we see also um, in verse number three these words. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And so uh, we see a rainbow surrounding the throne. And boy, when I thought about that for a second, why would there be a rainbow in heaven? And I began to think about uh, what God said back in Genesis chapter number, uh, uh, chapter number 9. I'd like you to turn there real quick tonight. Genesis chapter number 9. Why the rainbow in heaven? I believe it has something to do with what, what the Lord promised. The dwellers on the earth after the flood. In Genesis chapter number 9, verse number 9. 
We look at verse number 8, that kind of starts everything off. But Genesis chapter number 9, verse number 8. So the rainbow has its foundations back in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. The Bible says, And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall, there be any, uh, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is a token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it that I may remember the covenant, the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. I like that. God says every time I see a rainbow, I'm reminded of the covenant I've made. I did destroy the earth one time by water, but that rainbow, that bow in the cloud, when I see that, I'll remember my covenant with you. I believe that rainbow in heaven is is a symbol of the everlasting covenant God has with his people. Amen. And and that rainbow's up there as an eternal reminder uh, that God, when he makes promises, keeps promises. In the Psalms, we, we read these words, the mercy of the Lord endureth forever. Amen. I believe that rainbow is there in heaven to remind us that the mercy of God endures forever. God's mercy won't run out. God's mercy won't dissipate. God's mercy won't uh, ever uh, 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 be out of date. Why? That rainbow in the cloud is an eternal reminder of the covenant that God has with his people. Uh, Just like uh, uh, the rainbow that we see on the earth is an eternal reminder that God will never destroy this world by by water again. That rainbow in heaven, I believe, is an eternal covenant, an eternal testimony of the mercy that God has promised to us, amen, who've been redeemed by his grace and by his mercy. I'm glad, there's a, I'm glad there's a rainbow there, uh, that, that eternal symbol of the mercy of Almighty God. So as we look around heaven, we, we, we've seen some things. We've seen that open door. We, we've heard the invitation. Uh, we've seen a man in spirit fullness. We've seen the occupied throne and, and the appearance of the one sitting on that throne. We've seen the rainbow surrounding the throne. What do we see next? In verse number four, we see these words. We see this sight. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. We see 24 seats occupied by 24 elders. Now we know who occupies 12 of those seats. Jesus said in Matthew 19, verse 28, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, that's where we're at right now, uh, ye shall also sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And just like the, uh, there were 12 foundations representing the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, and just like 12 of those seats will be occupied, I believe, by the New Testament saints, I believe 12 of those seats will be occupied by 12 Old, set, Old Testament saints representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And so they're occupied by the saints of every age, Old Testament and New Testament. And so we see uh, these seats before the throne. They are in the audience of that throne and surrounding that throne. And they're there uh, as a witness uh, uh, to all that's going on uh, from that throne. And so we see these men sitting there. Uh, we, we will see the, uh, the apostles on their thrones. We will see the, the patriarchs of the Old Testament on those thrones, and it will be a wonderful thing. What do we see about these uh, uh, on the thrones? Well, uh, not only did they sit on their seats, but the Bible says they're each clothed in white raiment. Every time you see white raiment in the Bible, especially in Revelation, it's a picture of righteousness. They have made it uh, because they were deemed righteous by Almighty God. Their, their clothing, amen, is a clothing of white linen and, and clean and white. And that white is, the Bible says in Revelation 19.8, I'll just read it to you like it's written. And the Bible says, unto her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Well, what is or who is the righteousness of the saints? The Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that makes us righteous. He's the one that gives us our standing. He's the one that has caused us to have admission into heaven. And so nobody gets in there without that righteousness. And once they get in there, those old earthly robes are, are, are taken away. And we are clothed with those new righteous, those robes of righteousness that God himself puts upon us. 
if we were to take some time tonight, and I don't have the time to do it, uh, nor, nor, nor the, the leading to do it, but if we were to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when it talks about the transition from the earthly to the heavenly, uh, uh, from the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the carnal to the spiritual, uh, from the temporal to the eternal, we would see that there has to be a great change. He said, Behold, I show you mystery. mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Uh, again, uh, we, th this corruption must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. And when we do cease to become dwellers of the earth, either by death or by rapture, amen, and we become citizens of that heavenly country, God clothes us in new garments, and those new garments are white and clean. And so we see that these Old Testament saints and these New Testament saints are all clothed alike in white garments, that righteousness, and that's telling us that the Old Testament saints got to heaven the same way the New Testament saints got there, and that was by believing in the promises of Almighty God. And the Bible says Abraham uh, believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And so his, uh, his faith and belief in Almighty God, his trust in God is what earned him a standing in heaven and that's what earns us our standing as well our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and so that robe of, of, of white raiment is what they're clothed in what we will also be clothed in and what a wonderful garment it is we see that they were sitting on uh, 24 seats each clothed in white raiment each the Bible says wearing a golden crown uh, I, I love this, amen. Uh, the, the, these, these that were uh, occupying these, these uh, uh, prominent seats in heaven, certainly not near as prominent as the throne there, but, but occupying these seats in the audience of that, uh, uh, that great throne that Jesus Christ sat on there, uh, these men were uh, sitting there wearing a golden crown. And the Bible tells us uh, that uh, uh, one, of the, one of the things that we will enjoy as citizens of that heavenly country, and one of the things we do enjoy right now if we just consider it, is that Jesus Christ did something for us when he saved us. The Bible says in Revelation 1, 5 and 6, the Bible says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, which the Irwin just sang about so wonderfully. And the Bible says, Not only did he wash us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests. Well, what does a king wear? A king wears a crown. What kind of crown? A golden crown. And so these men have been made kings and priests, uh, uh, not by their own admission, not by their own devices, but they were made kings and priests by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And those crowns, again, uh, as the white robes show the, the righteousness, so do the kingly crowns show the, uh, their standing uh, because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they have crowns on their heads. It's very interesting in the Bible. There are crowns that the child of God can win, uh, crowns that the child of God can earn. I'll just walk through them real quickly. The Bible mentions uh, a, a, uh, an incorruptible crown in, in 1 Corinthians 9.25. And the Bible says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. So as we run this race, and if you run that race uh, that God has set before you, there's a crown to win. It's an incorruptible crown. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans in their games uh, ran their races and participated in their games to receive uh, crowns of laurels and things that would that, that would uh, uh, fade away and, and, and be destroyed after a period of time. We are running the race. We are following the Lord Jesus Christ and, and engage in the will of God to obtain an incorruptible crown, and one that never diminishes, one that never fades away, one that does not get rust uh, 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 cankered or, or moth-eaten. Amen. We have an incorruptible crown that we can win if we'll just run that race. The Bible talks about a, a, a crown of righteousness that we can earn. Uh, Paul mentioned it as he uh, uh, wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.8. He said, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that also love his appearing. How do you get this crown uh, of righteousness? By running that race, by staying faithful, but also by, by developing a love uh, for the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not, everybody can, not, a, not every Christian, not every uh, uh, blood-washed believer can say that they're looking forward to seeing Jesus Christ come back. The, 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 the Christian mired in sin tonight is not looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back. The, the wayward child of God is not looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back. They're, they're, not, they're, not in, they're not in love with that thought that Jesus Christ could come back right now. Amen? We have to cultivate that. How do we cultivate that? By running the race, by staying faithful to the things that God's given to us. I'll be honest, I hope Jesus Christ comes back when it's church time. I hope I'm in church, amen. 
I can't think of a better place to go to heaven from than, than, than a church meeting. I don't know if I'm looking to take the next ride up, but I'll tell you what, it sure would be a nice thing to have the Lord Jesus Christ come back as we're singing Beulah Land, amen, or uh, when we all get to heaven, amen. Wouldn't that be neat to have him interrupt our last verse? When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing, Psh, gone, amen. That'd be pretty cool. Uh, you say, Pastor Ross, you think like that? I do think like that. I, I've got scenarios worked out. It probably will never happen anyway like that, but uh, I want to make sure I'm in good standing. I want to make sure that uh, I've got a, a real short list uh, uh, that, that needs to be taken care of before the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. There are, there are believers uh, uh, that are going to be ashamed of His appearing, not looking for that. and They won't have that crown to, to look forward to. That's a crown to win, amen? A corrupt, uh, an incorruptible crown uh, uh, by, by discipling and by disciplining ourselves and staying in the race. Uh, a crown of righteousness, why? Just a developing a love uh, for the appearing, a, a love for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in James, we see another crown called the crown of life. The Bible says in James 1.12, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Again, when we love the Lord and we're willing to endure temptation and testings, amen, and we pass those tests, there's a crown laid up for us, the crown of life, amen, that the Lord has prepared for those that love him. I'm glad that God uh, uh, looks at, at the heart of us uh, and, and sees uh, those that love him. I'm glad that he makes promises conditional on that love. In Romans 8, 28, we see that great promise. Uh, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Amen. Uh, Pastor Ross, is this going to work out for good? I don't know. One of the first conditions of that promise working out is being in love with God. How do I prove I'm in love with God? Well, Jesus Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. Uh, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, uh, he it is that loveth me, he said in John chapter 14. That's pretty powerful stuff, amen. We can go around uh, uh, minor birding all day long. I love Jesus, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, but the proof's not in the talking or the squawking. The, the, the proof is in the walking, amen. Uh, do I love him? I love him by following him. I love him by obeying him. Let me just say this. I'm not saying to obey a man. We're obeying not a man. We're obeying the words of God. We're, we're obeying the, the spirit of God. We're obeying the, the things of God, not man. That's how we prove we love God. And Jesus Christ said, uh, uh, he, he promised a, a, a crown of life to those that love him, to, to the man uh, or the woman that endures temptation, that, that, that passes those tests that God lays out for us. In 1 Peter 5, 4, we see that there's another crown, uh, a crown of glory that fadeth not away. And the Bible says, when the chief shepherd appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Amen. That kingly crown that we see these... Uh, um, these Old Testament, New Testament saints, the 24 elders uh, wearing, amen, is that crown that fades not away, a crown of glory. And then Jesus Christ also promised this crown in Revelation 2.10. He said, uh, Fear none of those things which uh, thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Uh, but be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So uh, that crown of life uh, is mentioned all by James, but also by the Lord Jesus Christ, the promise to those that love him and those that endure the temptations uh, that come our way. Jesus said we're supposed to guard our crowns. In Revelation 3.11, he said, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. There are those that can steal those crowns away. Those can uh, encourage us to lose those crowns or forfeit those crowns uh, by their example and by their, uh, uh, by their misleading and by their deceptions. We've got to be very careful that we don't lose those crowns. So we see these four and twenty elders on, on twenty-four seats, each clothed in white raiment, each wearing a crown. What do we see next as we uh, uh, glance around and, uh, and, 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 and take a look around at, at our heavenly home? Well, coming in verse number 5, we see these words. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. It almost seems kind of scary. But what's going on there when we see these, uh, we see these uh, lightnings and thunderings and voices? It, it, these are awesome displays of majesty and power. Uh, uh, there were several times when the Lord, uh, when, when the Heavenly Father spoke to Jesus Christ that those who were standing by thought they heard thunderings. And so that voice is a very powerful, very rolling, very, uh, uh, very uh, uh, captivating voice there. I, uh, lightnings and thunderings. I don't know about you, but one of the most awe-inspiring sights I think I've ever, uh, that I get to see uh, are, are, are the uh, lightning storms. You ever fascinated by those? Uh, one time we were, we were flying back from, uh, from California, and we were flying from uh, uh, Oakland to uh, Phoenix. 
and we were flying into Phoenix, and there was a, a lightning storm going on in Phoenix, and our plane was above the clouds. And if you've never seen a lightning storm from above the clouds when the lightning's going down, it is an awesome sight. I, I was just glad it wasn't coming up at us, amen. It was going down to the ground. But, but the lightning and just watching the lightning just uh, go through the clouds and, and, and fill the sky, and it was beautiful. It was a dark night, and you could see Phoenix all lit up, and that, 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 that desert sky there, the lightning just racing to and fro and going down this way and that way it was an awesome display. Uh, uh, we've been to the ocean a few times and seen some lightning storms out of the ocean. That's a pretty powerful display there. Well, that's kind of the, the, the awesome displays of God's majesty and his awesomeness. And even that word terribleness would come into play here. Uh, uh, you know you're someplace uh, special and important, the lightnings and thunderings. It's, it's very captivating. It's very uh, overwhelming. Uh, the old, the, uh, an old-time preacher said this. He said, mortal man could not, could not in his mortal body withstand the glory of seeing heaven in his natural state. It would be too awesome. It would be so overpowering that he would die immediately from the, from the awesome spectacle of that laid out before him. And I believe that, amen. The lightnings and thunderings and the voices there uh, are, 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 are something that, uh, that captures the attention uh, of uh, uh, those taking a glimpse of home. So we see the awesome displays of majesty and power. What else do we see? Well, in verse number five, we see some pretty interesting words. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. He said, Pastor Ross, I thought there was only one Holy Spirit. Yes, yeah, a very interesting way uh, that, that uh, uh, we see God the Father on his throne. We see the Son on his throne. We also see a visible uh, representation of the Holy Spirit there. Uh, the Holy Spirit's a spirit, okay? And, uh, uh, and we understand that God's a spirit. And they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. And, and so uh, when we see the Spirit in the Bible, uh, sometimes uh, uh, in, in, in the book of Acts, uh, when the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was represented as, a, uh, represented as cloves of fire lighting upon the head uh, of those in the upper room. Is that right? When Jesus Christ got baptized, uh, uh, it was written this way, uh, that the Holy Spirit descended like as a dove. And he took the form or the, uh, the image of a dove coming down and lighting upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this time we see the Holy Spirit rep being represented by seven, uh, uh, the seven lamps uh, uh, there uh, lit uh, before, the, uh, before the throne. And it says, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, the number seven is very interesting. Uh, it may have been given to the Holy Spirit here with reverence to the diversity or the fullness of his operation on the souls of men and to his uh, agency on the affairs of the world. And, and let me just say it this way. I took that, obviously, from a, 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 a commentary on the Bible, but, but seven's that number of perfection, and the Holy Spirit is perfect in all of his doings. And, and, and again, he is dealing, has just finished dealing with the seven churches uh, of, of Asia there, and so we see that spirit uh, being represented as, as having an effectual agency among those seven churches and now uh, is now being pitched as being in heaven uh, uh, before the throne. And so we see a visible display of the Holy Spirit before the throne. What, what do we see next as we look around and continue to look around uh, uh, this glimpse of home? We see um, in verse number 6, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And we see a calming peace, that sea of glass there. Now, it's not always going to remain a, a, a sea of glass, but for the time being, there's a, there's a calmness there. Why? God has called his children home. The, the saints of every age are now uh, in their heavenly home uh, with, their, with their Savior, with the Heavenly Father, with the Spirit of God. And there's a, there's a calmness there. And so th th that, uh, that sea of glass is very smooth, uh, uh, a calming influence. Yes, it's, it's contrasting with the lightnings and thunderings going on, but there's a calmness to the people of God. There's a calming influence when we know that we're in the palm of God's hands. And so that, that calming influence is seen there uh, and represented by that sea of glass in front of the throne. Some of the neat things and some of the, uh, uh, the, the, the very uh, things that would tax our imagination comes up next in verses 6, 7, and 8. Look with me there. The Bible says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like in a crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast had a face as a man, the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Well, I'll tell you what, you don't need comic books, amen? Uh, there's some really strange creatures up there, uh, things we've never seen down here on earth. And so John uses uh, earthly descriptions to give us an idea of what these heavenly strange creatures look like. They're strange to us, and I don't mean weird, I just mean strange because we've never seen them before. Strange because they're different from anything that we've ever experienced before, but these are creatures uh, that God's created that we've never got to lay eyes on before. And when we get there, 
there, we're going to see things we've never seen before. And some of those things we've never seen before are these strange creatures there. And there, there are many strange creatures mentioned in the Bible that we've got no idea uh, other than the words of the writers of the Bible uh, as to what they look like. But we, we take their descriptions and try to let our imaginations be fired. We have, first of all, the seraphim in the Bible. Uh, they are called the attendants of the Lord of hosts, and they call attention to his holiness. Now, they are found in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. They have three pairs of wings. In Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 4 to 25, and also in chapter 10, um, we see the cherubim, or the living creatures, and they have only two pairs of wings, but they have four faces on their head. The front face uh, is the face of that of a man, the right side that of a lion, the left side that of an ox or a calf, and the back of that an eagle. And they have the hand of man under their wings uh, on each of their four sides. They are the guardians of the throne of God. These are strange creatures that we see written about in the Bible. So we see them in Isaiah and Ezekiel, and now we come to the, the four beasts or the four living creatures uh, of Revelation chapter 4. Now these differ from the living Living creatures of Ezekiel in that each beast has, instead of having four faces, uh, these have one face. The first beast had the face of a lion, the second of that of a calf, the third that of a man, and uh, the fourth of that of a flying eagle. Each beast has six wings and has eyes before and behind, full of eyes, the Bible says. You say, Pastor Ross, that looks like some kind of monster. And when we get there, uh, we'll be glad they're on our side. I'll tell you that, amen. They're not against us, they're for us. Uh, uh, calm down, they're all, it's all good. And so we see these, the, these four living creatures there, and we see the seraphim, and we see the cherubim there. These are creatures that surround the throne, uh, that have a special function, a special part to play in, in the workings of God that we have not been privy to yet. Uh, oh, I don't know if they've got some eternal... Uh, 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 work that they'll be performing, but we do know that God created them for himself. Now, what do we know about these living creatures? Well, we do know about these living creatures, uh, that they have this ministry. Uh, the Bible says in verse 8, uh, the Bible says, They rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. What do we see in there? The holiness of God mentioned three times. Were they stuttering? No, they weren't stuttering. A uh, holy heavenly Father, a holy Son of God, and a holy Spirit. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Not only do we see the, the Trinity mentioned in their comments there, but we also see uh, the eternality of God mentioned there. Uh, uh, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was. That, that means God's God of eternity eternity past and is God's God of, uh, of eternity present and which is to come. God is a God of eternity in the future. And so we see the eternal nature of God being referenced by these holy creatures. And the Bible says they rest not day and night. And this is their message. This is their testimony. And this is what, it, what is heard, uh, uttered by these creatures. And what, a, what an incredible thing it is. There's a consistent offering of praise to God by these strange creatures, but not only by them. The Bible says when they, when they begin to say and give thanks to him that sat on the throne and give, uh, and give glory and honor to him that sat on the throne. In verse number 9, uh, the Bible says, And the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So we see that consistent offering of praise to God by the strange creatures, by the actions of the 24 elders. And then lastly, we see that statement of devotion and worship. I'm always glad when Dan has us sing this song for a scripture song. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive honor and glory and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. That's a testimony of praise and adoration and respect and reverence to our holy God. That's their praise. The four and twenty elders get in on that. It just seems like when, when one creature starts praising God, everybody gets in on the action. And I think, I think that's a wonderful thing. We've just seen a little glimpse of home in chapter 4. There's other glimpses given throughout Revelation, but I just thought chapter 4 was just that, that neat snapshot of, uh, of some of the things that would be seen right away as we hit heaven. Yeah, there's going to be a golden street there. We haven't even talked about that. The, the river of life up there, we haven't mentioned that. Uh, uh, the physical description of the city itself, we haven't even looked at how majestic and how wonderful and the awesome dimensions of that, uh, uh, of that great heavenly city. But I'll tell you what, our first glimpse of home is a pretty interesting one. Many sights I'm looking forward to seeing, amen. I want to see how close John gets uh, uh, in his descriptions of what we really see with our eyes. And I'm sure we'll appreciate John's effort to make them as vivid as possible. But uh, I'll tell you what, I don't think it's going to mean a whole lot when we get there. Because I think, I think our attention is going to be drawn to the one sitting on the throne, the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think we'll be terrified by these strange creatures. I think we'll be so enamored with our view, our first views of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think we'll notice anything going on around us, amen. And I'm just going to say that for my sake. I'm glad that he's on the throne today. I'm glad he won't stay seated forever. I'm glad that one day the father's going to look and say, son, it's time to go. And I'm glad he's going to get up off that throne 
and uh, the archangel is going to accompany him. He's going to come back down to the atmosphere of this earth. That trumpet's going to blow. That call to come up hither is going to be uttered. And guess what? In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it's all going to be over. Amen? No more sadness, no more goodbyes, no more hurts, no more heartaches, no more frustration, no more pain. Uh, it's going to be all said and done. Amen? And all things are going to be made new for, for us at that point. What a day that will be. A day of rejoicing, a day of great gladness, a day of relief and rescue for us, and a day that I'm looking forward to. I was coming in this morning and saw Brother Ken sitting in the fellowship hall. How you doing, Brother Ken? We live, we're living the dream, amen? We're getting one, one day closer, one day closer to getting out of here. And I'm looking forward to that day. Uh, I'll just say like, uh, 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 like, um, like the Bible says, it, come quickly, Lord Jesus, amen? And when he comes back, we'll get to see some of these sights we've only dreamed about and only heard talked about here, and only considered with our eyes from the words of God, what a day that's going to be as we get our glimpse. Uh, not only our glimpse of home, uh, but get to enjoy our new surroundings in, in heaven.